we run this call as a developer. Okay, not oh, a few, okay. So who is a business analyst or a product owner who, who works in product? Who defines product? Even business, maybe. Who's, who's in the business themselves? Okay, not too many. Oh, yeah, a few. That's great. Now, who's a tester? Some testers here as well. Okay, who's an architect? Someone like an architect. Okay, there's a lot and a lot and a lot of people uh, of different roles, which is fantastic because it's all those different roles that we will need in order to build our powerful roadmaps. So in order to get through uh, this session, we're going to use an example, an exam and we're going to build a roadmap along the way. And that example is of a corner store. And anyone knows examples of a corner store that you might have, uh, a convenience store, we call it oftentimes as well. And this is a typical old style, a convenience store, no online presence, none of those things. But you see that the lady who is um, who's basically owning the store um, is, is about to retire and her son Bill is taking over. And Bill has fantastic plans. He wants to take the store online. Uh, he wants to build out a whole uh, empire of, uh, of grocery stores. And he wants to make sure that they feel exactly like the store that he inherited from his, uh, from his mom. Right. So he's got a lot of plans. He even got a marketing um, a marketing slogan ready already, and that is at yourconvenience.com, right? That's kind of uh, the, the website, conven yourconvenience.com, that he's referring to, and all of his emails are at your convenience. So he has a whole bunch of features that he wants to introduce. He wants to make sure that the store is accessible, not just online through a laptop or, or a computer, but also through a mobile phone, and um, and even a tablet. He wants to make sure it's very convenient and that people can use it uh, with the payment methods that they're used to, with the credit cards or the debit cards that they've been using along the way. He wants to make sure it's easy to use, that people can very quickly find the products that they need and order those, right? That they don't have to go through a very difficult and painful selection or product selection process. He wants to make sure it's feature rich, that all of the coupons, for instance, that people have been using in the store that they're used to, uh, which is one of the reasons why they come to the store, that all of those coupons are still valid, that they can still use the store in the same way as they did before. And of course, it needs to be recognizable. It still needs to be his mom's store. That's really, really important. It needs to feel like a store around the corner, even though it's on the internet. And he's got an awful lot more things planned, like delivery, like making sure that people are rewarded for uh, shopping at the same store over and over and over again. He's got a whole bunch of things. And he goes and talks to his IT team, and together they come up with a roadmap. So let's look at that roadmap for a second. So they say, like, the IT team is fairly smart, and they say, like, okay, so, Bill, we, we don't want you to need to wait for six months or nine months before you get the first piece of value. We wanna make sure that we deliver this roadmap to you in an incremental way so that you can push a certain release out, that your customers can start using it, that you get some revenue from that already, and that you can get feedback that you can use to improve your product. Now, Bill says, that's great. Let's see, what does that look like? So the first step that they wanna uh, make, the first, release basically that they want to introduce is to ensure that they have a product catalog. Got to do this anyways, right? If you provide a store, you need somehow a list of all the products that you're selling. So why not providing that up front? Why not having this as the first release, enabling your customers to see what you have to offer? And at the same time, they can take a quick peek at the products before they even come to the store while the online purchasing capability is not implemented yet. And of course, the next functionality would be that we can online purchase, that we don't just see the products, but there's also a buy button that we can click and then suddenly and automatically that uh, product appears on our doorstep. It's great. And then we get into the more refined and custom ideas that, um, that Bill had in mind. So one was personalized offers because now we have the data, right? As soon as we start uh, uh, 
allowing customers to purchase things online, then we start seeing all the data uh, related to those purchases. We can start figuring out, okay, so what do these people like? Maybe they like pasta and anything related to pasta, sauces and those kinds of things. And whenever there is a commercial or there is a, a sale of a, a pasta sauce or a type of pasta on, maybe we should send it out to those people specifically and it would attract more customers or at least um, entice them to, to buy more, right? And then the next one is loyalty. So how can we now uh, ensure that these customers keep on coming back? So who thinks that this is this is a valuable roadmap? Who thinks this is a very valuable roadmap and there's well thought out and we can get value along the way? Any thumbs up? Okay, there's a few. So who thinks this is this is not so valuable a roadmap? There's problems with it. Well, there are some people who think there's problems with it. It's going to be hard to try to figure out what those problems are that you all see. But if you can put those in a discussion, uh, I would really, really appreciate that. And just uh, just take a look, uh, just add, add them to the discussion. What kind of problems you see with this particular roadmap? So uh, in the meantime, I will keep on I will keep on going forward. So there are some problems with it because um yeah there's a timeline missing um there are some some dependencies uh there's uh, no architecture runway in there um there's a lot of complexity that's interesting okay so these are some really good insights um yeah the competition is not in there so that's not uh not added either so there's a, a couple of really interesting uh comments that we get there so what happens is bill says you know what i think this looks really 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 nice uh <laughs> This is uh, good. So people have a gift of foresight as well that the online purchase is going to be a super epic all by themselves. Okay, so this is all great. So and these comments are very, very meaningful. And, uh, and I, I encourage you to take a look at them as well. Uh, and not just me. So the, the team starts delivering this roadmap, right? And they, they start building the product catalog and that goes relatively well. And everything is kind of on schedule. And suddenly Bill is capable of putting all those products online. And he's very, very happy, right? He says like, yep, yeah, great. This looks fantastic. We have our first milestone. Let's get to our next milestone right now. And let's continue with this online purchase. But they run in a few problems as um, I think Mayuresh uh, started to, to see himself as well. Um, so the problems that they're dealing with is, well, they suddenly need to start thinking about, oops, they suddenly need to start thinking about um, integrating with an inventory management system. They need to start thinking about how do we integrate with a point of sale so we can actually help um, people pay, right? And, and we can also automatically get that from our, Get, get that included in our uh, accounting. A and how on earth are we going to deliver frozen foods? There's a lot of people who come and purchase ice cream. Uh, how on earth are we going to ensure that this ice cream is still ice cream by the time that people receive it, right? So all of that stuff, we really need to think about this, right? And what we're getting is, while we're addressing all those problems, it's not gonna be released at the time that we thought it would. It will take us an awful lot longer. And it will take us an awful lot longer to get to that second point. And while we are trying to get to that particular milestone, we're, of course, missing out on a couple of opportunities. So one opportunity that we're missing out on is the early feedback. We don't get this. I mean, if it takes us three, four months before we can actually have this online purchase out, that's three, four months that Bill doesn't know anything about uh, his customers, about how they feel about the new functionality, how they feel about the choices that they have made. There is also late return on investment. All of this time, Bill has been paying his delivery team to ensure that they're working on, uh, on the implementation of this roadmap, to ensure that they're working on his online store. And he's not making any money yet because the first coin, the first dollar that he will make will be when the first product is sold. Uh, through uh, through the online store. And we're far from that, right? Especially in, not until we, we have this online purchase. And honestly, we don't know how long that will take. And there's also little flexibility and somebody was uh, was referring to this in the comments as well. Um, there, These features are sequentially and th there's really no way uh, to go anywhere. And if you go back 
um, if you go back to the roadmap that we showed in the beginning, a map between multiple cities with different options to get from one city to another, depending on traffic, depending on where your mind is at, depending on whether you want to uh, use highways or more like uh, back roads where the scenery is more beautiful. Each and every one of those things will inform you um, which roads to take. And there's multiple options that you have. So really, is this really a roadmap that we get? Um, anyways, the reason why this is, the reason why we have a roadmap like this is because oftentimes they are built by IT. They're built by IT, not necessarily with the business in mind. And what we're doing is we're kind of creating an, a, a solution and we're building the different components of that solution. And when you look at the functionality, there is um, a clear um, link with the content management system that provides the product catalog, the e-commerce system that provides all of the shopping experience, um, the, the, the building your cart, the uh, the the billing the customer, the uh, the following through on the process, the order management itself, and so forth. And all the rest is custom development, personalized offers and loyalty. And maybe there are some libraries that you can use to help with that, but it's mostly custom, definitely needs a lot, lot more configuration. So what we're actually having is, instead of a roadmap that allows us to get feedback really early, that allows us to get return on investment, that, that gives us flexibility on which roads to choose to get to a certain point, we're really getting something that more looks like this, which is a road. And on that road, there's multiple stages and you really can't get to point five until we hit point one, two, three, and four. And what we're really doing is we're building in dependencies in our roadmap. Those dependencies are actually driving the schedule and that's kind of our problem. So we have an alternative. But let's first uh, summarize again what the problems are. So what we really have, instead of the logical building blocks that made up our roadmap, we have technological building blocks. And those drive the, the schedule. Those dependencies drive the schedule. It's no longer priorities. It's no longer the business value that they all deliver. It's really the dependencies between the individual pieces. And that actually leads to infrequent incremental value delivery. And as a result, very little opportunity for feedback. And why would we need to get feedback anyways? Because we have no flexibility in changing another route depending on that feedback. So we're not really enticing our, um, our developers to take that feedback into account because we really don't have an option. After stage two, there's stage three, there's stage four, there's stage five. There's no alternative to two, three, and four, and five, right? So that's always the challenge that we're dealing with. So the alternative approach is based on something that I started introducing quite a while ago. This is a picture of, I think it's about eight years ago when I first uh, started using this approach. So the project was for, um, it was a fairly complex project. It was all engineering. And uh, the, this was a customer who was making um, landing gear for uh, airlines, for, uh, for Boeing and, and Airbus and so forth. And um, so what they had was they had a whole army of engineers who needed to calculate the strength of individual pieces, like an individual bolt or a piece of metal or a shank or any of those things. And they, they had a piece of software. Actually, they didn't have software. They had a, an Excel sheet where they used, uh, that they used to track all the calculations and they needed to model the impact of force and all those things on it. So they asked us, uh, to build a, a piece of software that would allow them to work together with all of their engineers around the world. So our team of uh, business analysts took their 100 page uh, requirements document and uh, tried to split this up into smaller pieces. And we just been introduced to the, the company had just been introduced to user stories and agile methods. So we came up with, with a whole bunch of user stories like like 100, 200, I don't know anymore how many. And then they asked me, uh, so how can we deliver this incrementally? And I looked at this, um, all of these user stories, they were all in Jira. Uh, I looked at all these user stories and I said, oh, I, I don't even know where to start, right? Like two, 200, maybe more user stories. Uh, all of those things really don't make a, an awful lot of sense. They're very dependent. They're not real user stories. Uh, yes, they use their user story template as a, 
I can do something so that uh, I achieve a certain goal. But honestly, they're not really good user stories. So the problem that we kind of had was, how do we make sense of this mess? Right. So then we started thinking, well, you know what? This is a very risky project for us. This is not something that we've done in the past. We haven't built anything for uh, for an engineering team. We were more like uh, in, into the cust business to customer and business to business market, but not really into uh, um, yeah engineering solutions, if you will. So, so let's figure out what all those risks are and let's try to address those in the beginning. And when you look at this, I don't know if you see it. I hope you can. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think you see it, but when you look at this, um, this image on top, the, the top line, I'm trying to use my mouse to, uh, to indicate anything. Um, you see that there's all the risks that we kind of laid out there on the top. And the first milestone was, try to figure out how we can build this framework as, uh, in with as little uh, functionality as possible. The second one was, how can we add materials? Because materials were really important. Are we going to use this in, in, in uh, aluminum? Is this going to be iron? All of those things had a significant impact. The third one was we needed to actually integrate a module that already existed, excuse me, within, um, within Excel and so forth so each and every one of those things would add a tiny bit more functionality and would address a risk uh bit by bit and the functionality underneath was functionality that already was identified by our team of bas and we just tried to figure out okay what of that functionality actually is addressing part of that risk how can we do the minimum amount of user stories to address that risk and know that we're on the right track in um, in delivering that business value for our end customer, right? And this is where it all started from. So um, let me give you a tiny bit of theory to, to, to show how this actually is solving our problem. So this is a, a slide or at least an image that comes from Alistair Coburn, one of the 17 original um, signatories of the manifesto. And he basically is saying that while we're doing, while we're building software, we are making a whole bunch of decisions. We're making decisions about which functionality we want in the product and uh, that we believe the customer needs in order to solve their problems. Which um, patterns that we're going to use, user experience patterns, in order to provide that functionality in the most user-friendly way. About how we're going to implement all this, how we're going to structure the code to deal with the load? How are we going to test it to ensure that we have enough confidence? So all of those decisions that we make along the way are based on assumptions, are based on assumptions of how the customer is going to use the application, are based on assumptions on which, which devices the user is going to uh, use the application on, are based on assumptions of how uh, many people are going to uh, access the, the platform together Right? And that will inform us um, on how we deal with uh, concurrency and how we deal with the load of the system um, are based on assumptions of what mistakes the programmers can make, where the complexity sits, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. Right. So all those assumptions, however, we cannot be sure that we uh, we made the right assumptions until the very end, until we finally give our software to our end users, they start using us and they tell us whether or not we are right. They tell us just by using the system. If suddenly the system falls over because there is a thousand people uh, concurrently starting to use our services, well, then clearly we didn't make the right assumption about the load of the system. If the features that we spend most time and most money on are never used by our users. Well, then clearly we didn't make the right assumptions about what was more important for them and what was not. If after two days, our service desk is bombarded with, uh, with calls about the functionality not working, then clearly we didn't make the right assumptions about which parts of the system uh, needed extra testing and which part could be left alone. Right. So those assumptions, we already can we only can validate them at the very end when we give this application to our to our users. And what we are trying to do is we're trying to figure out whether those assumptions are correct earlier on in the process. So we have more time to resolve them. So what is a powerful roadmap? 
a powerful roadmap deals with those assumptions really early on. And it, um, it is built of milestones, just like any other roadmap, but every single milestone delivers real progress towards their end result. And that real progress either comes in the form of value delivery, in the form of some piece of value that you, you offer, or in the form of uh, addressing a risk or mitigating a risk, right? So the value really is either we, we do something that makes the customer um, achieve their goals, right? Like in Bill's case, we can sell stuff or we address a risk. We address a risk that the solution that we had in mind is not working. So the second thing that is important is every milestone, just like you saw in that image of about eight years ago, every milestone gives a very clear description of what the value is that we're bringing in that particular step. And also those milestones are really, really smart, uh, small. And uh, the third thing that is really important is that feedback that we get when we achieve such a milestone is going to inform us about what, what next step to take, right? So uh, think about it when you go from city A to city B, um, maybe there's in the middle, we have a crossroads where we can either take a left or take a right. What's going to, uh, what's going to make us choose either way? Maybe it's a traffic, maybe left is more beautiful and right is more highway. All of those different things, they will inform us. But a powerful roadmap is one that uh, uses that feedback uses that feedback to make your uh, your way to success uh, more meaningful and also to try to shorten it. Okay, so what does that look like? Well, there is a, there is a process for it. Um, the process is, is relatively simple, even though it might look a little bit complex. We're going into the details in a bit, but, uh, but I'll, I'll explain what the process is from a high level right now. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to identify really the problem that we're solving. And I'm talking about the problem, not about the solution, right? We need to separate the problem from the solution so we know what we need to address, right? There's a whole bunch of things. There's a whole bunch of risks that can come with the, the solution itself. But we want to uh, ensure that we address at least the risks that are inherent to the actual problem that we're trying to address. The next thing that we do is... we we need to kind of know something about the solution is we're going to build a high level solution architecture, right? A high level architecture that gives us an idea of, uh, of what the different elements and the different components are in the system. We'll see an example of that as well. Then we're going to list the risks. Those risks need to be both business risks and, technolo and technical risks. So the business risks really being associated with the problem, the technology risks really being associated with the solution. And oftentimes those technology risks, the choices that we're making might introduce, uh, might introduce new, um, new risks as well, might introduce new business risks, right? So if we indeed are going to implement this application in a certain way, it might throw, um, throw another risk in the mix. So once we have that, then we're going to calculate something we call risk exposure. And we're going to sort our risks according to how much impact they have on our success. That's ultimately what it boils down to. And then we're going to mitigate those risks. So the ones that are uh, have the most impact, we're going to mitigate them first. We're not just going to mitigate them by saying, uh, okay, well, if, if a, a risk that... Uh, that our, our team members are taking off the project that is a risk and we won't be able to deliver on time. Well, how do we mitigate this? Well, we mitigate this by, by ensuring uh, that we're very clear on the value that this project brings and by keeping uh, good relationships with people who might steal our, uh, our developers away. Yeah, that's not really addressing a risk, is it, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to use the functionality that we already wanted in the project in the first place, that we already wanted to be part of the application, we're going to look at that functionality and see which one of those are actually mitigating those risks. And that will ultimately inform us uh, about, uh, about our timeline and about how we want to deliver this, how we want to incrementally uh, deliver this piece of functionality. So we're going to assess how much of that risk that functionality addresses and, uh, and then use that to
to prioritize the functionality and basically the roadmap rolls out of it pretty much automatically. So let's go a little bit deeper into what those pieces are. And you see on the right-hand side, top right, you see where we are in that process when we are talking about those issues. So identifying the problem. So why is this important? It's really important, as I said, to separate the problem from the solution, right? We want to make sure that we address the problem and not necessarily uh, the, the solution that, that the, the customer or even us as a delivery team came up with. And the easiest way that I find uh, to the easiest way that actually helps us to, to get to such a, uh, such a real problem description is to try to write it down in an elevator pitch. So when we're thinking about, for instance, uh, Bill's grocery store, then this elevator pitch could be something like, we want to build a website that allows a customer experience for uh, online shopping similar to our corner store. Well, okay, first of all, this is a mouthful. There's an awful lot to say about that. So um, we get the point, right? I mean, Bill is, uh, Bill is pretty clear. We, we know what we want. He wants a website and so forth. But suddenly we are seeing that that website, is that necessary? Is that part of the problem or is that part of the solution? It looks like a website is more related to the solution. So we kind of want to strip that context from the problem description. So we don't want them to describe that it's a website. We want it to be a, an online shopping experience. So, um, so we get to something like this, providing an online yet personal corner store experience. Nobody says it's a website. If we can deliver this in a different way, if we can... For instance, use uh, a marketplace that is already available. Why not, right? This, this might be something, this might be all we need. This might be all that Bill needs. So it's really important to strip the problem down to its core. Next thing that we do, we build a high-level uh, architecture, a high-level solution. And I'm really talking about high-level. We really want to look at the different components, the responsibility they have, the main responsibility and how they somewhat interact. And we see that the user is going to need something like a catalog because they need to uh, be able to see what the problems are or what the, the products are. They need something like a shopping cart or anything that allows them to shop around and uh, collect items that they will later check out. On the administrator side, we need some accounting, of course, because uh, when the, the store is going to attract a whole bunch of customers, we don't want to do this all by ourselves and manually. And we need a way to see the orders that the customers are making so we can fulfill them and ensure that they get delivered. And those components on the bottom, those great components, those, those can be uh, technical components like content management system that, that facilitates the building of a catalog or a payment engine and so forth. You get the point. And honestly, this is the depth that we need at this point for this particular solution. For a solution that is a bit more complex, you might see some more uh, ellipses and some more boxes, uh, but that's only normal. But for this solution, that, that pretty much uh, satisfies our need. That's all we really need. So let's get to the next point, which is listing risks. And here I want to I want to stop for a second because this is really where the fun starts, right? Um, so those risks. One of the things that we got to do in any project is doing risks management, and this is this is really really important. Right. But oftentimes we don't do it really well. We don't spend the necessary time and we do it only because there is somebody who watches over the entire process to um, because there is somebody who ensures that that's risk, this risk identification happens and that we can mitigate. them. But no, what we want to do is we want to use that risk management process to drive our roadmap so we can get real value from it and we can address the real risk, not the risks like, yeah, what if the budget dries up? Oh, what if uh, it takes longer than we thought it would? Oh, what if somebody pulls a, a person away from our team? No, no, we want to talk about the real business risks. So we identified a few. And there's obviously an awful lot more, but just just for um, for the purpose of this exercise, we we looked at a couple of things uh, like, well, what if we cannot guarantee that the ice cream will make it on time to the customer? What if someone and and I like to, as you see as well, I like to um, uh, create what if questions to 
communicate those risks. So what if something like this happens? What if something like this happens? And if we use what if questions, then it's an awful lot easier for the business, uh, not technological people, but for the business to participate in that brainstorming as well. So what if somebody from the other side of the country tries to buy this stuff? Bill is not ready for that, right? What if you're out of the product that people want? What if the customers are not interested in the service and so forth? So there's a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of risks. And you see that this list contains both technological risks, but also business risks. So the technological risks are more like, well, what, are, what if you're out of the product that people want? That is something that we should be able to uh, to get through our uh, inventory management system, right? And uh, so if we can integrate with that, then we have this information. So that's more like a technological risk. Or a point of sale system, the fact that we can integrate with that, that's also more like a technological risk. But the fact that all of these things are listed in the same um, in the same section may, enables the business now to participate in this conversation as well. So next thing that we want to do is we want to um, uh, calculate the risk exposure. And what is risk exposure? It's the opportunity cost times the probability. Opportunity cost is the money that you're losing. And preferably, this is addressed as money indeed, is the money that you're losing when this risk occurs. For instance, the risk of uh, customers are not really interested in this service. Well, the, the, the money that we're losing is all of our investment, plus we're not making any sales. Compared to a successful product, we're making a million dollars of sales every year. That's a million dollars right there. What is the probability? Well, the probability is really high. Why would they shop with us instead of with an Amazon or, or, or a Walmart or something else, right? So that's a probability cost. Uh, the opportunity cost uh, times the probability is the risk exposure. And when we start assessing this, and I didn't assess it in terms of money. Uh, you can do it in terms of your business case. Uh, you can do it in terms of a uh, percentage of revenue. Or you can even say it costs our team three weeks to deal with that particular risk. Any one of those things work as long as it's something that the business understands and as long as it's something that the business can calculate with. So uh, we're just assessing it very lightly uh, on, a, on, a four, um, on a scale with four ratings, plus, 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 minus, and minus, minus. And we're seeing that uh, in this assessment, for instance, what if we're out of the product that, that people want? Okay, well, um, the cost is really high because that means that we're not selling anything. The probability of it, yeah, okay, may maybe it is, it is high, but it's not as high as the next one. What if customers are not interested in the service? Probability is really high and the cost is really high as well. So probably this is the highest risk exposure. So now we start using that to work on the risks that have most impact on our final solution and on the success of our product. And um, so we need to start doing that and we need to start mitigating those risks. And how do we mitigate risks? Because uh, risk exposure is a combination of um, the uh, opportunity cost and the probability. We either reduce the uh, the probability of the risk occurring, or we reduce the cost that is associated by uh, or with that risk once it occurs. That's mitigation of the risk ultimately. So if we work on either one of those two, we're good, right? So we want to use plan functionality to do the risk mitigation functionality that was already on the list, already in our backlog. And uh, there is a couple of additional strategies that we can use. Uh, to um, uh, to ensure that we address that risk. And I, I have four that I kind of wanted to call out because they're somewhat special and I call them Lisa. So the first one is Lure. We add a piece of functionality that forces us to deal with the risk. Let's say, for instance, our problem is an inventory management system. You know what? The next piece of functionality that we plan needs the inventory management system. So whatever step we take, we have to deal with this. Our risk disappears. It disappears solely because we can implement that particular piece. The second one is inform. And that is, you know what? We don't have too much information yet about, uh, let's say, our customers interested in our service at all. How can we get more information? Well, maybe we just need to build a website and maybe we need to put a button on there and that button will uh, allow customers to say whether they're interested or not. And, uh, and we will, uh, if, we, if we get an awful lot of messages, 
from uh, customers who are interested in the service, well, then we have more information about the risk or at least about the probability of it occurring. Uh, SPY is not something that reduces the, upper, the, the risk uh, or the probability of the risk occurring, but reduces the cost when it occurs. So a great example there might be, let's say that if something goes wrong, we need to sift through all the logs to try to figure out how to deal with that problem, revert something in the database and so forth. But if we know that, if, if that is a risk, why don't we have a separate log file with specific information related to that particular risk that might occur. When it does occur, do we know exactly which file we need to look into? We have a stripped down information. We don't need to spend the time uh, to, um, to sift through all of those log files. That would be a spy. And then we have an avoid. And avoid basically means we avoid the risk altogether. And we'll see some examples of that as well. So there is an algorithm there as well, and I, I need to keep my time in mind. There is an algorithm there as well to use this so that, that you can use. So we want to mitigate a risk. So let's just look at whether or not there is planned functionality, functionality in our backlog that already would mitigate this risk. If that's not the case, then we just implement new functionality, add mitigating functionality. We add something different to the list. And of course, that new functionality might... Um, lead to new risks. So we have to follow the process all over again. Now, if we do have functionality that already addresses that risk, then the next thing that we need to do is, do we need it all? Do we need the entire piece of functionality? Or can we just take a small piece out to increase the frequency of our feedback or to reduce the investment that we need to make before we know something more about that risk? If we can do that, then we extract the mitigating functionality. We put the rest back on the backlog. If we can do that, we implement the whole thing. And then we just go to the next step, which is assessing risk reduction. So that next, uh, our mitigating functionality for the application here is uh, build a product catalog. And so, um, do you know you have five minutes? Yes. Yes, I know. I've uh, been keeping an eye on, on my watch as well. Thank you. So building a product catalog uh, and a little bit more. So, so that would definitely uh, help with uh, mitigating some of those risks. Providing a shopping list, right? It would actually uh, inform us whether or not people are interested if they use this functionality. Um, offer a virtual wallet as a payment. That would uh, help us reduce the costs that we have associated with credit card, uh, small credit card purchases and so forth. Offer pay at delivery. You get the point. There is a whole bunch of mitigating functionality that uh, address certain risk. And if we if we look at the risks that they, they address, we can look at uh, build product catalog. It's really helping us to... Um, uh, to, to understand whether or not our customers are interested in our service in the first place. Uh, but there's other things that have an impact on that risk as well, like provide a shopping list will tell us whether or not our customers want this service, which was the most important risk that we wanted to address. The second most important risk was that credit card transactions are too expensive for small purchases like an Apple. So, um, so basically, offer pay at delivery would, would help with that. Offer virtual water as a payment would help with that. So this functionality is actually addressing that risk to a certain degree. And some of those uh, pieces of functionality address multiple risks. Some of them address the entire risk or basically reduce the, the probability by a tiny bit or gives us some more information uh, about the risk, a tiny bit more information. And based on that risk reduction, based on how much of the risk it actually uh, gets rid of, we, uh, we can prioritize our functionality. And when we're doing this, we kind of end up with something like this. And this is not prioritized, this list of, uh, of features. Uh, we're building a product catalog, then we're providing a shopping list and so forth. But you see on the right-hand side that we can actually branch off. And if we, while building a product catalog, we already know that we have a thousand people who immediately responded to our request and they said, yes, we're interested. Please sign us up. Let us know when this uh, purchasing functionality is available. Okay, great. If that is the case, we can skip the shopping list and we can go straight to uh, showing product availability in the product catalog. 
which is basically addressing our uh, integration with our inventory management system. And then based on the feedback or the challenges that we have related to this, we might say, you know what, let's do a range pickup in the store. And this is kind of a business decision at that point. Uh, we do a range pickup in the store or we organize delivery. So you kind of get the point. We have, instead of just a single line, a single road through multiple milestones, we actually can branch off. So this is again the process. Uh, I talked about it uh, at length before and you'll uh, be able to download the slides as well. So you can look more uh, into, into the details. So I just wanna reiterate that and in a powerful roadmap, every single milestone we deliver on an objective. Instead of just adding new features out there, instead of just uh, providing new, um, um, yeah, new scope, right? So we're actually delivering on a certain milestone. And um, what really are the benefits of such a powerful roadmap? Um, it is that it allows for prioritize, prioritization instead of for scheduling. We can focus on the things that are really important, the things that are addressing our risks, the things that are uh, capable of preventing us to be successful in our project. Because of those powerful roadmaps, our customer can help with the prioritization because they might not understand the dependencies between technical components, but they definitely do understand how risks impact their potential success. Delivery remains flexible because we can use the feedback from those, deliver from those milestones and we get real value at them. The biggest risks are addressed really early in the project. So later in the project, most of our risk is already taken care of. And there is, um, and, and we've, we've addressed the biggest issues. Uh, it's not like in a marshmallow challenge where we put the marshmallow on top at the very end of the game. And we get additional value from risk management process that we need to do anyways in order to be compliant with the project management practices. So the things that I want you to remember is that a roadmap is not a schedule. That a roadmap is really something that allows you to prioritize the functionality and deliver um, something in an incremental way. And that in those increments will deliver value along the way, every step of the way. I want you to focus uh, on the fact that business risks are really important and that we shouldn't only look at technological risks. And, and I hope that you saw a way to do this. Um, I want you to think about risk mitigation and, and, and that risk mitigation that will actually generate your roadmap and give your um, and give you your information on what to do next. And I want you to seek fast feedback because that's really what makes your pro uh, products uh, an awful lot stronger and, uh, and more meaningful. Um, I have nothing more. Thanks for the session, uh, Gino. That was awesome. Um, and uh, thanks for everybody participating here.